The year, the year Jack was 1977. 1977, I was 11 years old. As an 11-year-old boy, I was very impressionable, and I had a double whammy. I was very gullible. And I had older sisters, so they knew if they told me any story, my mind would be caught up in it, and I would believe it. So if they told me there were pirates out in the front yard who just sailed in on Lake Erie to come across to our, to our house, to bring me to their ship, I'd look out the window and I'd see them behind the bushes with knives clenched between their teeth ready to grab me. So I would, you know, I would not go outside. Another problem I had is I watched a lot of TV. I was raised on TV. And uh, one show in particular, 1977, that caught my attention is, was called In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. And if any of you are that old, you know what I'm talking about. And they had one show in particular that to this day chills me, brings terror in my bones. It was In Search of Myths and Monsters. And let me show you two of them. See if you know who they are. Do you know who that monster is? Jim, you know who that monster is? Bigfoot. What's his real name? Sasquatch. Sas I like Sasquatch. And then who is this? Nessie the Loch Ness Monster. So, growing up, I would watch this show with my dad and my sisters, and they knew how to play up my fear. So if we'd go across the street and throw sticks to our dog in Lake Erie, my sister would say, Chris, did you see that? That giant serpent's tail out there? And I'd look, and I would see it, and I'd go, can we can we go home? Can we go home? Or my dad would take me out to our local woods and walk the dog. So Chris, did you hear that? Sounded like sticks breaking from some big foot out there. And I'd say, Dad, can we not go deeper? And he'd ignore me, smile, and keep going deeper in the woods. And so I'd grab two sticks and click them to get rid of the monsters. If you ever watch Parent Trap, you know what I'm talking about. Really works. I haven't seen Bigfoot in the woods yet. My young mind, my young mind locked me up in superstitious prison. I believed things that were not so. And because of that, I lived in fear. And oftentimes, my older sisters loved keeping me in that box of fear because they were free, because they knew what was true. And they liked to play in their little brother's impressionable mind. As I grew older and I matured, I learned to swim in the deep of Lake Erie. But the woods still scare me. Because you never know. Bigfoot might still be out there. But today we're going to talk about this idea that knowing the truth can keep you from living in fear. However, and this is really the main point, but knowing the truth doesn't necessarily make you kind, loving, or helpful. Sometimes knowing the truth can make you quite mean to, towards others. My sisters love to watch me squirm, especially when they said there's some hobgoblin or monster or ghost hiding behind the door in the dark. But what we're going to see in this passage, the, the issue of knowledge and fear is going to be taken to a higher and more important level. So if you can stand, the title for today is Knowledge, Knowledge That We Have Can Only Go So Far. In 1 Corinthians 8, we're going to read the first six verses, but we're going to look at the whole chapter. But here's 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now concerning food offered to idols... We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be 
so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. You may be seated. So, if you remember last week, we said that the second half of 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to start dealing with very specific questions. And he's going to deal with very specific questions. Last week, some of the questions he was dealing with was marriage and family. This week, he is going to be dealing with something else. It's the question, got some butcher block. The question is concerning Meat. That's what the issue's about today. Meat. What would happen in a Corinthian culture is you could go to the local market and buy your meat. You know, and it looked very much like this. They'd cut some right off the animal and slap it down there. That's what it was like in Russia. They'd slap it right down there. And so they could go also to the temple. In the temple, people would bring meat to worship their gods. And they would get one-third of it, and they'd burn it and sacrifice to the god. They'd give one-third of it to the priest as his dinner because he was in service to the god. And they would share one-third of it as a meal together as if they were worshiping this god together as a community. Now, what's happened in the Corinthian church is there were some that were in a church that were were mature. They understood things. And so they just saw this as meat. And to me, I think they might be the forefathers of the Michigan Dutch. The meat, meat was cheap there, so why not get the meat at the temple? A lot cheaper. It's just meat, right? But, mind you, there was another group of believers that used to worship at the temple, and they used to worship God, so they still saw this as an offering to the gods. And when they would watch the other believers going into the temple or buying from the temple, they were appalled because they thought it was complete betrayal of Jesus. You think masks are bad? This was serious business. So this is what's going on. What do we do with meat? That's the question. However, that's not the issue. Paul's going to talk about the real issue. And the real issue, when you read closely in this passage, is more than just meat. More than buying something cheap or buying something expensive. It's really about knowledge and how you use it. The real issue is this. Who matters most? Yourself or others. So instead of talking directly about the meat, Paul's going after the root issue of what's really happening in the church's heart. And it is how people use knowledge. Look at verse 1. Verse 1, Now concerning food offered to idols, so there's the meat, we know that all of us possess knowledge. So wait a minute, we're talking about meat, but he's jumping into knowledge. And you'll understand what he means in a second. What he's saying here is that knowledge is something we all have. Knowledge is amoral. It's not necessarily good or bad. It is. But how we use it is what makes it good or bad. Knowledge is a tool. And when it is wrongly used, it puffs up. Look at verse 1. This knowledge puffs up. Knowledge is used wrongly when self makes it about me an end. I use it to show you how intelligent I am, or how superior I am, or how informed I am, or I've already arrived. You don't need to teach me anything else. It is wrong when we use knowledge to make me look good. And a lot of people do that. Specifically, let's talk about church doctrine. A lot of people love to argue church doctrine. But why do they argue church doctrine? What's the point? So they can win arguments, 
so we can seem like we have it all figured out, so we can teach classes and get degrees and impress others with all that we know? Why do we learn knowledge? So we can win trivial pursuit? I'm the smartest one in the room. Ask yourself, do you share knowledge to edify others or impress others? Look at verse 1 again. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but, but, he's saying there's another way, love. It builds up. Who does it build up? Love always builds the other up. That's the point. So this is where two and three come in. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not, not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And so Paul, it's, it sounds kind of like, what does that have to do with anything? But what he's saying, he's implying that the correct use of knowledge is given to us as a tool. God gives us knowledge so we can know God. That's why God gives us knowledge. And then when we know God rightly, we love God. And then when God's love comes into us, we just naturally love other people. So God uses knowledge as a tool to know him, not to get smarter. Solomon talked about this in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 and 13. Here's what the NLT says. But my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful, for writing books is endless, and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. And even earlier in Ecclesiastes, God says, or Solomon says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So the question is, do you know God? So how do you know if you know God? How do you know if you know? What he's saying here is you will love others. Go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, 7 and 8. First John 4, verses 7 and 8. And John writes, Beloved, which is brothers and sisters who I love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. That's the point, knowing God. That's how you know is you love one another. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God. So you can say you love God. You can say how all of this wisdom you have about God is in your mind and in your brain, but if you don't love your neighbor, you really don't love God. And that's the point. So what he's going to do now is he's going to bring it down to practicality about the meat. He's going to start talking about the meat. And he says, let's first talk about what we know. What is known? And it's verses 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians 8. He says, therefore, as to the eating of food, so he's talking specifically about what we know when it comes to the meat, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. So here's what we know. First thing that he says we know is an idol is nothing. An idol is, is make-believe, like Bigfoot or Nessie. The reason why is because Scripture teaches this. The Lord is God there is no other God besides him. That's what he's quoting here. Do you want me to use that, Sharon? Am I all right? I'm all right. He's quoting that in verse 4. Verse 4 says, there is no God but one. So what he means by that is Scripture teaches us 
how to properly view the world, and specifically how these other gods that they're worshiping with the meat are nothing but illusionary idols. They're fake. They don't exist. In the culture at that time, they believed in many so-called gods, is what he says here in verse 5, and many lords, such as Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, Isis, the whole pantheon of Greek Roman mythology. All of these gods that live up on, on Mount Olympus, like Hades, and you know, Isis. And he's saying they're make believe. There's a lot of gods in our day. I'll give you three biggies. Because Scripture says there's no other God beside him, that means then Allah is not really a God. That also means Krishna is not a God. That also means Buddha. Buddha actually didn't come across as a God, but people worship him as a God, but he's not really a God because it's all make-believe. How do we know it's make-believe? Because the Lord is God. That's the point. That's what Paul's saying. Second thing he says we know is we know that God is our Father. He's our Father. He says it in there. And as a Father, He will take care of all of our needs. We don't need to sacrifice to Him for Him to give us something. A sacrifice has already been made to give you everything. His Son. We also know that God the Father and the Son made all things. Through Jesus, all things exist. Without Him, not anything made has been made. And then the third thing, we know that all things that are made are for him. So Jesus made this meat. What? Not some God behind it. Jesus made this meat. So we need not fear. So the implications are, because of this, go ahead and eat. Go ahead and eat the meat. It's just meat. Because we know we can, however, eat the meat, does not mean that we should. Because we can do some things because our knowledge says it's no big deal, doesn't mean that we should do those things. Because knowledge makes us independent. But our independence sometimes is not good. Look at verse 9. Verse 9, Paul says, take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Well, but, I, but, it, but there's no God behind this. Why can't I eat the meat? Why can't I eat the meat? And here's the reason why. Verse 7. Because not all know the way you know. Look at verse 7. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. Just because you may be, be mature in your thinking, Paul's saying, doesn't mean everyone is. So, take care that your knowledge doesn't destroy the faith of the weak person. Weak in mind. So, what was happening in verse 7 some of the young believers, some of the young believers still thought that eating meat was worshiping a pagan god. That's why verse 7 says, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol. They really did believe they were still worshiping a god, as if it existed. And to them, that was disloyalty to Jesus. So if they saw other believers going to the temple, they're like, what are they doing? And sometimes those other believers say, oh, come on, no big deal. And they would go, but it would, it would terrify them. It would ruin their conscience. It was a serious moral issue of the soul. Let me give you two examples. One's very lighthearted, and one I would say is a little bit more serious. So after I saw In Search Of, I really did believe Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, was in Lake Erie. I really believed it. And we lived right across from Lake Erie, and we'd have this big cliff we could look over, and on stormy nights I'd look out, and I'm telling you, I saw Nessie at least seven times. I'd come back and I'd say, I think he's out there. Well, she's a female, so I think she's out there. <laughs> and so my brother Don and Steph played it up. And so when we would go on a sunny day out to Lake Erie and go swimming in the deep, they'd say, oh, come on, come on. 
And in my mind, I'm like, you're going to die. Nothing's going to grab your leg and pull you down. And so they jump out of the water and they try to push me off the pier and I'd be terrified, like I'd be trembling. I was an 11-year-old scaredy cat. I'm not kidding you. My son to this day watched Jaws one time. He never wants to go in the ocean. And the poor lad is 21 years old. It's my fault. So the lack of knowledge hold, holds people back. And here they really didn't know yet that God is, there's no other gods but God. Let me give you a more serious example and you understand the fear that can take place. Have you ever heard of a Ouija board? Do you ever hear of a Ouija board? I don't even like to say that in church. I don't even like to use that word. It is a, actually, it's a stupid kid's game where they sit around this table and they push this little thing, ask it a question, and it gives them answers. And they think it's, woo spooky. It's like a ghost is pushing it around. Well, I know it's a piece of wood. I know that. And I know most of the time it's just kind of manipulated and there's not necessarily a dark force behind it, but I will not play it. I won't allow my kids to have one in the house. And honestly... I don't joke about it. Why? We're going to learn in chapter 10 there really are some spiritual beings out there that are a little bit darker. But some people can still play it. That's fine. Okay. But I can't. I just can't. And that statement that I just can't is what was happening to the weak believer. I just can't eat that meat. Oh, come on. Like the knowledgeable person will say, get over it. I just can't. Because in their mind, it would cause them to sin against God. So the question then is, do you care about the weak person? Do you care about the outsider who doesn't see the world the way you do? Especially in our political climate these days, it's crazy. And there's, there's a way to tell if you care and don't care. So the question he's saying is, let's start to care about one another. But you can tell that you don't care, and we find this in verses 10 through 12. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating, that means the one who knows that there's no God behind this idol. If anyone sees you have no knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? Like, you might pull somebody back into something they thought they left. That's what he's saying. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it's weak. You sin against Christ. So when you cause somebody who's not sure in their soul to do something that's against their convictions, you're actually causing them to sin because something that's done without faith is sin. That's the point. So how do you know you don't care? Well, who cares? I just keep on doing it because I'm free and I'm no better and nobody's going to not let me do that. I flaunt my freedom. So it was happening with some of the mature believers, the ones who saw meat as just meat and nothing more, were convincing the weak believers to come join them and eat at the meal. Gordon Fee, one commentator, writes, While the weak brother may indeed acknowledge that there is no reality to the idol, But what the others is only food is still for them food sacrificed to the idol. It becomes, therefore, an act of disloyalty to God. So those in the know, those who know all the knowledge, see eating as just an act of, I'm just eating food. However, the weak are internally feeling they are going against their God. It's a big deal. They feel they are displeasing the one that saved them. So that's why this is so serious of an issue. By causing someone to violate their own conscience, they were causing them to sin against Christ. I do want to say in a caveat, this is not about an offending somebody in a church. Like sometimes if I don't wear a tie, someone's offended. That's their problem. That's not, I'm causing them to sin. This is causing somebody to emulate you in a practice they're not too sure about. And it might be sinful against God. So I tried to think of scenarios that 
really go along the line of this specifically. And this, and I would say next week we're going to talk a little bit about masks. I wouldn't say masks falls into this issue. Masks is more about a personal conviction, not about causing someone not to sin or not to sin. But I do believe there are some issues. And I've written two. I have seen this issue arise when it comes to the drinking of alcohol. For years, conservative churches like ours have taught that any amount of alcohol is sin, plain and simple. And one of the main reasons it's been taught this way is because the major abuse of alcohol that occurs in our society is one of the reasons for failed marriages, major car wrecks where people die, number of died in our church from that, and sexual promiscuity that happens while under the influence. So churches have drawn a line and they have said this, all drinking is sin. And I would say from about the mid-20s during the prohibition till about really the 70s and 80s, that's how it's been taught and even thumped on the pulpit. Drinking is sin. But if you read Scripture correctly, logically, and you let it shape your mind, drinking alcohol in the Bible is not sin. Drunkenness is sin. Around the late 90s, this teaching started catching on in conservative churches, and even some Christian colleges like Cornerstone relaxed their drinking policy. And as a result, there arose a new group of beer connoisseurs in the church. Oh, it's free, so let me now... See what kind of beer I can drink. Because it's no longer a sin, it became kind of a cool new hobby. Testing different brands of beer and even some whiskeys. And be, some people in the church became quite proud, promoting their knowledge of lager, stouts, and aged scotch. scotch. Some Christians went as far as drinking at Bible studies and some home fellowship groups started including beer as a regular part of their meeting signaling this, they had a deep understanding of grace that was far above the average weaker conservative's understanding of grace. However, some people would join a group who once had terrible addictions to alcohol and would question the salvation of people in a group. Like, if they're really a believer, would they really be doing this? Or some people would join in a group that made this sort of a common practice, and they would often fall back into drunkenness. I know of some groups that fell back so far they became enslaved to the alcohol and couldn't meet without it. They care more about their freedom than they do about helping those who are once enslaved and not really helping them fall in love with Christ because that's the goal, to help others know Christ. Here's the second one. And this one is more related to the current culture. I would say how we handle discussions online. We have the freedom to say what we want via t uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'd say TikTok is still from the pit of you know where. I'm kidding. But not everything we say online glorifies Christ. Just because I think I have knowledge or a correct understanding of an issue does not mean I have the right to belittle, mock, or insult those who don't see things the way I see them. And I am not speaking about an idea or position that may offend you and, you know, people want to silence others. I'm not talking about offending somebody by my belief. I'm talking about destroying the dignity of another human being or causing people who listen to your arguments to begin to hate a group of people. I've had to come to grips with this in my own heart this week. Not that I think my convictions are wrong, but I think my ideas and the way I presented them sometimes causes people to see the Jesus that I worship as someone who hates certain group of people and even enjoys mocking and dehumanizing them. And if that is true, then I cross the line. Truthfully, I love the debate. I love the debate online, but the freedom to argue does not mean I can flaunt my superiority. I am trying to be, and I think we all need to, should try to be, attractive forces for Christ. 
not a person who thinks himself smarter or even better than others. And if I've mocked or belittled any of you, I ask you for forgiveness. That's not my intent. As Paul says here, I do not want to push away or crush the conscience for someone who Christ died. Whether that be a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, a Progressive, a Communist, and even those who are so sick of politics, they don't ever want to talk about it again. And I think there's a lot of you out there like that. Argument, knowledge, and ideas are not wrong in sharing them, but what is wrong is when we think we've arrived and we are better. I think that's where I went wrong. So those who do care, how do they act? How do people that do care act? Look at verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. How do you know if you care? You want everyone to mature. Love is much more powerful than freedom. Oh, man. Just because I can eat the meat does not mean I'm really benefiting others when I do eat the meat or drink the drink or rip somebody online. We need to understand that all of us are in different stages of our walk with Christ. Within the church, we are a family. And in a family, the stronger and older are required to help the younger and weaker. That's how it works. Some of us know a lot. Some of us are doctrinally astute. Some of us have just begun to read the Bible. But we're not in a competition to see who knows more. We're in a competition. No, we're not in a competition. We, are, we, are in the, we have the responsibility to grow together in maturity to love Christ. So if you care about others, you will help people mature. I think this is why Jesus spoke in parables. He could have impressed the world with heavenly words. of. Could you imagine the words Jesus could have used when he spoke down here? I don't think we would have understood a word he said. But he was trying to reach little children like me. This is why sometimes I use a lot of, this is why I use slides, honestly. And I don't read from a theological dictionary where I could big, use big words like lapsarianism and, you know, the penal substitutionary Vicarious atonement of the Savior and Lord. Like if I use those words, wow, that guy is smart up there. But my job isn't to be seen as smart. It's to help all of us love one person. Take, for instance, the story of Loch Ness. When I was an 11-year-old boy. It, like when I think back on it, how my sisters bugged me. It's funny, honestly. I don't, I don't mind it. I'm going to get back at them someday. But if they would have sat at the TV and said, Chris, you know that this show's fake, don't you? They're just trying to get viewers and spark fear, and it's not real. You know that, don't you? And then if one of them would have walked me to Lake Erie and slowly swam out to the deep with me, smiling, see? I probably would have handled it much better. But you never know, because my mind is still kind of bizarre. But what is sad about the situation with meat. What is sad sometimes with other things is just our lack of love. And their lack of love was causing some people to go back to their old patterns of sin. That's terrible. That's terrible. Gordon Fee sums this up great. Everyone, everything one does that affects relationships within the body of Christ should have care for brothers and sisters as its primary motivation. That's exactly right. I want to finish with these two thoughts. Knowledge, for knowledge's sake, makes you lonely. So if I'm just learning to impress you, people are not going to want to be around you for too long. Have you ever been with a person say, man, I just caught a fish? Ha oh, ha, you should see my fish. Hey, I've been over here. Oh, I've been there, done that. Have you ever been over here? After a while, when people start talking to you like that, you kind of like, see you later. I kinda, you don't really care about me, so I don't want to talk to you anymore. However, knowledge that loves makes others holy. 
Knowledge is given to you to help other people know the Lord. And it's amazing. So my question for you is, how do you use your knowledge? To impress or to love? 